not to finish on, with any, on any big note. Rather, um, we wanted to show how the area of software verification, it has importance and growing importance, but it's a deep area. And it's an area where there's lots of fascinating things going on, um, as illustrated by the comments from um, my colleagues here on the panel. So, well, thank you for listening. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Fascinating stuff. So, uh, Peter O'Hearn there with Andy Gordon, Jasmine Fisher, and uh, Byron Cook. Um, so, there's a really nice kind of flow through the, uh, through the concepts uh, this afternoon. So, uh, in Andrew's keynote, we heard a lot about um, Microsoft researchers' uh, expertise in programming, which then led to that discussion on, on verification. And um, we kind of went from failure to F sharp there, I guess, didn't we? Uh, so, uh, and Jasmine obviously was, was telling us uh, all about um, verification in biological systems, which leads us very nicely on to uh, Stephen uh, Emott's work. Um, he's head of the uh, Computational Science Group. Uh, at MSR, as we heard there in, in the keynote. He's also Professor of Computational Science at uh, Oxford. And he's going to pick up on and, and develop the biological theme, um, telling us a little bit more about what to me is an absolutely fascinating area, um, seeing sort of biological entities as, as, as computing uh, structures. So, uh, so let's hear now from, from Stephen. Here he is. Okay, um, thanks very much for everybody, uh, to everybody for coming. Um, about half the people just left, and that's a surprise because no one's ever even heard this talk before. I can understand it if they had. Um, so, um, so, in the next 15 minutes, in fact, 14 minutes by the time I've said this bit, um, I want to try and do my best to convey three simple ideas that we're working on in my lab, uh, and principally through Andrew Phillips's work. Uh, uh, who uh, Andrew Blake mentioned earlier. Um, and the first is, um, it's all going to be at a very high level, apologies. So the first is that there's going to need to be a transformation, the sooner the better, of the way in which we think about biology. Uh, and ultimately, um, understanding complex living systems is going to require us to think about biology as computation. The second is that in thinking about biology as computation, it's going to open up the possib possibility of being able to program biology, or program life. And the third is that if we are able to solve what are fairly considerable challenges at the moment in being able to program life, it will have, a, has the potential at least to be at least as important in the next 50 years as programming silicon has proved to be over the last 50 years. So with my 14 minutes, or my watch says three, but I think we're running over, um, I'll sort of crack on if I find what to do. So, um, so uh, why life is computation? Um, well, I think to put this into context, for about the last 50 years or, or more, depending on uh, your point of view, uh, the biology community has really focused on thinking about biology as, a, as an increasingly bewildering array of parts. Uh, and it's important to point out that typically the biologists, and I am one, so I feel as though I can, I'm happy to be, I'm, to be as critical of my own community as I need to be. Um, but, the, but the biology community have increasingly thought about those parts and studied them either outside of the system in which they operate or in a system that's not working properly, i.e. a disease system, or in a system that's dead. And that's not that helpful. Um, and over the last 10 years, um, I suppose the systems biology community or the systems biology domain has really kind of tried to extend that by, by looking at the interactions between those parts equally in systems that typically uh, either not working properly or a system that's dead uh, or in, uh, looking at those interactions outside the, the system in which it normally operates. Now this so-called spectacular success of molecular biology over the last 50 years has resulted in the fact that we don't even still know how a cell works um, and that's not surprising given the fact that using the same sorts of approaches we would never learn uh, how a radio works. Um, so what's clear is that there needs to be a fundamentally different approach to understanding the problem of you know, what does biology do in understanding living systems, which actually is required, is, a pre, is an important pre precursor to an, a, a much talked about and needed revolution in medicine. And I'm going to come to that right at the last, uh, right at the end. Um, so why computation? Uh, well, it's, it's a 
I would argue it's as good an idea as any, given the fact that we still don't know how a cell works after 50 years of, of, of spectac so-called spectacular success of molecular biology. We don't need to abandon the notions uh, of molecular biology, though. Um, and I think that um, I think it's most importantly at the level of a cell, which is the rather than the gene, uh, and certainly not at the part, uh, it, it is the, the, given the fact that the cell is the fundamental unit of biology uh, and of life, that's where we need to start looking. That has to be the sort of basis. And if you look at the cell, everything that a cell does is computation. You know, the, 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 the only thing that the cell really needs to do, it was well, the only things, are sensing, communication, information processing, decision-making, uh, what you might want to call battery optimization, energy optimization, and even, even virus detection. That's really all a cell does, and that, that's, the, that's basically the, the entire thing that keeps an organism alive. And all of those things are effectively information processing and, comp and biological computation tasks. In short, there's no survival without computation uh, for a cell or an organism. Um, so the molecular machinery uh, for implementing all of those computational, those biological computational tasks are contained uh, in a, what you might want to call a molecular program. Uh, and let, for, the, for the argument's sake, for this talk, let's just say that the, the principal molecular machinery is DNA. There's, there's a discussion to be had about RNA, RNA and a range of other proteins, but that's not for this talk. Um, and um, so, before I sort of get into the talk, there's a number of interesting things, that I just, a number of important things I just want to say quickly about the difference, and they're obvious things, between digital software and what you might want to call living software. The first is that, you know, the last 50 years of digital software has been based upon this sort of ones and zeros, uh, running on silicon that runs in your hardware. The living software that's your cell has uh, four letters, uh, four amino acids, um, and they're either paired in, in CG or AT, uh, uh, and that's very, that's very looks very different from the way in which we think about computers today. But but we've got you know six point something six point seven billion proofs of concepts that, that biology does computation very well. It's just sometimes very different sorts of computation. Um, every one of those cells, you, you've got ten to the fifteen cells. Every one of those cells has three billion of those base pairs that I talked about, CG or AT. Um, that means that there's two meters of DNA packaged into six micrometer package, which is uh, the chromosome. Um, and so what does it do? Well, first of all, it does program self-assembly. So you go from this molecular program via a stem cell to the assembly of 10 to the 15 living computers, uh, such so as you and me, uh, in this remarkable, uh, this remarkable sort of process where the software creates the hardware, effectively. So you imagine buying Windows 8, all you have to do is take it home and unwrap it and it actually builds your laptop. That would be, <laughs> that would be great. Um, it might cost you a bit more than it does now, but uh, that's fine. Um, so uh, the other thing it does is, of course, is, is, a, is a wide range of, of uh, biological computation tasks. I'll just mention two in the interest of time here. First is um, it, it, your, your immune system is basically a, an excellent uh, uh, biological computation system. It's the one thing between all of us in this room and the cemetery. Um, because we're constantly bombarded with viruses and pathogens of one sort or another uh, 24 hours a day from birth to death. Uh, and all the immune system does really is, is biological computation. It just does information processing. If it does that information processing well, it keeps you alive. If it stops doing it, you, you die or if it, if it makes errors. So that's, this is an amazing information processing uh, 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 biological computation, computational uh, system. Uh, similarly, um, the, 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 only, the only reason why you're able to see me and the only reason why you're able to see this wonderful cube on the screen here, which actually doesn't exist, um, is because of the biological computation that's occurring in every one of your retinal gangli ganglion cells, your lateral geniculate nucleus, and area V1 in your visual cortex that enables this remarkable feat of biological processing, which is your brain, and in particular, I think the visual system is, is, epitomizes the, remark uh, the wonderful computation that occurs in the brain, so just to sum up at that part of the talk, you know, what does 15, 10 to the 15 orchestrated living computers look like? Uh, well, for many in this room, uh, it looks like me. Uh, uh, many, many, many of you will be surprised about that fact of uh, living computation, uh, but you'll probably be even more surprised to uh, uh, learn that uh, Paris Hilton is 10 to the 15 uh, living computational systems, um, and uh, that may come as a bit of a surprise to some. 
but if it's any constellation, so is grass. Uh, so every cell in every ear of wheat basically performs uh, information processing when it wakes up every morning about what, how much photosynthesis to do, how much uh, nitrogen to fix, uh, how much energy, energy to devote to a particular task in order to uh, grow this thing called food. Again, I'll return to that at the end of the talk. Uh, and trees, uh, wonderful information, biological computational devices, systems, information processing systems. Every morning a tree wakes up, it has to decide how much energy to devote to photosynthesis or to growing or to nitrogen fixation uh, or to its roots or to evapor evaporization. And that's a very dynamic task that's done every, every day by every cell in every leaf of every tree on the planet. And there's something like three trillion of them. Absolutely amazing biological computation in action. I'm going to return to that later on at the end of the talk as well. So, on to the second bit. Understanding life as computation uh, opens up the possibility of being able to program life. Uh, and in the broad sense of the term, I think I just want to sort of say, and there's, there's some, there's some generalisations here which are in, in some sense scientifically are not helpful, but for this purposes for this, they'll suffice. So we can think of the notion that, underpinning the notion of programming life is that sequence determines function, and that if we can design the sequence, we can design, theoretically, we can design, design the function. So there are two challenges to that. The first is the physical implementation of a novel program inside a cell or inside a genome. Um, and actually, that turns, out to be, that turns out to be one that's being tackled very well. Uh, we know how to do this, uh, and there are two ways to do it. One is through DNA strand displacement. These are the two main areas. There are some others. One is through DNA strand displacement, which is, which is what we're working on. Uh, and the other one is to engineer genetic circuits in cells, which we're also working on. I'm, just going, to, I'm going to talk about the former in a little bit more detail in a, in a moment. Um, so DNA strand displacement, um, you, if you, it's in, the interesting thing about this long two-metre ball of, of DNA uh, in each one of your cells is if you, if you heat it up, it unravels the double helix and you can separate it and do things with one strand and another. And if you cool it back down, it will actually go back into the double helix. So, you know, you hold your bit of DNA over your kettle, uh, it unravels, uh, and then you sort of do what you want with it in terms of inserting some, more, some, more some, uh, some design DNA. That's challenge two, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, so what this really means, in a bit more formally, is that the consequence of what's called Watson-Crick duality um, is that uh, uh, pairs will only uh, hybridize, meet together, if they're actually going to perform some function, and they can do, and, uh, and, and, and can perform some function. If they don't, like the pairs don't match, they just won't do it, so it won't bind. So, DNA is also um, separated into two domains. One is called a short, a short strand of DNA, which is called toehold DNA, which is what the T is here, and the other one is what's called, uh, like in this, let's call it body DNA, or specialised DNA, uh, which is a much longer sequence of base pairs. And if you want to do DNA strand displacement, you get your DNA over a kettle, you unwind it, um, and then what you, can sh what you can do is, in the top bit here, we, we, have, ha we have our, let's say, let's say that's our designed bit of DNA that implements some function, and we want to replace the design bit, so we want to replace the, the ordinary bit, which is the bit on the bottom, with the design bit, which is on the top. So what we can do there is, and, and each pair has a complementary base, which is what the T symbol is. So what we can do is, if, if the DNA is going to do something, the design DNA, you get it, it, the toehold, um, it will bind it through the toehold part of the, of the strand and then go towards uh, fully migrating. If, there's, if, there, if, if it's not going to perform some function, that will bind, that, that's reversible and won't bind. But if it is going to perform some function, it will bind and then displace the original strand and you're left with a new strand of double helix DNA, which is your designed part, which should do something novel in terms of function. That's a simplification, but that's basically it. Challenge two, which is the biggest challenge, um, is the design of new function itself. And that's, the, that's our primary focus. We do do DNA strand displacement, but the biggest challenge, and if solving this one would be a, would be a massive uh, uh, advance in our ability to, to program life, is how can we design, or what's, how do we do the rational design of new function? Because the way in which strand displacement is done at the moment, it's basically sort of, it's like a, just a mechanical process. It's really in the, in the, in the Stone Ages. This would be even pre, prior to the advent of valve computers in the 50s and the 40s. So what we've been working on, again, principally, uh, Andrew Phillips has been leading this work, is on a language for programming life. And I'm going to quickly um, 
I'll go through it. So what you need as a language for programming life is, as you do with any other program, is, is a calculus and a syntax. I'm not going to dwell on this in the interest of time. You need an, an a software environment for designing a DNA program, which we've done. You need to be able to simulate that DNA program, which we're also able to do. You need to, you need to be able to then compi compile that program actually to DNA itself, which we're now able to do. And then you can manufacture that design DNA. At the minute, it's what's called oligonucleotide DNA, so it's basically sort of fairly short DNA in the scheme of things. It's not two meters. Um, and uh, then you can insert that into a cell and get the cell, get the cell or the systems of cells to perform some novel function. And we're, the, we are able to actually get cells, living systems, to perform some novel function. It's fairly simple novel function at the moment, um, but it's very early days. I mean, you say just, just cracking this challenge is, is, a, is a big advance. Um, so just to conclude, um, programming biology, so we're, very, we're all very excited about all of that lot, even though there's lots of challenges uh, still, un, still to, be, um, to be overcome. So programming bi biology has at least, has the potential at least, to be at least as important as programming silicon over the, the next 50 years, as programming silicon has been in the last 50 years. And I just want to mention uh, a, a few important ones. So I think thinking about biology as computation uh, uh, and life doing biological computation, I think would totally transform the science of biology, biolog bi biological science and systems biology. Uh, and I think would usher in a new field of biological computation as opposed to computational biology. Uh, and that's, again, that's very early days, but that's, we're, we're beginning to sort of uh, uh, make some headway in, in thinking about and, and, and in sort of pioneering a field of biological computation. Um, the corollary of that or, is basically if you do that, I think it would usher in potentially a profound revolution in medicine. Again, this is not without its challenges. Um, but you imagine being able to repair um, congenital diseases uh, in the womb uh, through being able to actually repair DNA. So, for, ex so for example, some, you know, some, some interesting ones and some, some important ones are things like uh, lysencephaly, uh, subcortical band heterotopia, or Miller-Dicker syndrome. So really uh, a profound brain def defects uh, which are not possible to detect prior to, well, certainly past the termination date of a birth. Of, of a baby, so you, so you, so the baby has to be born, but the ba baby's never lived beyond about six years old. It's actually, we know that we actually we do actually know a little bit about how we might be able to repair the gene on chromosome 17 to be able to actually unwind um, that de that congenital brain disorder uh, in in the embryo, for example. Again, a long way off, but I'll just give you one example. I'll just give you one example. Or in immunotherapeutics is really kind of a, a new area that that will really require our ability to, when the immune system goes wrong, to be able to repair it using programming life techniques. Computing, as I said, you know, there are at least 6.7 billion proofs of concepts that, that biology does computation reasonably well. Um, it's just, in many senses, a different form of computation to silicon computers. But it may well be the case that the, 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 the foundations of the next century of computing might be uh, in biology. I, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's exciting to think so, though. Energy, you know, in, by, the, by 2040, there's going to be 9 billion people on this planet. And currently, there are no known ways, unless we start building um, a nuclear power station every week, uh, which isn't happening currently, of how we're going to power the planet uh, with 9 billion people on it. And the UN have recently said that by the end of the century, there may well be, be between 10.1 and 11 billion people on it. And there is no known way that we're going to be able to power the planet uh, using, uh, using uh, uh, existing approaches. And, but yet there's enough sunlight falls on the planet every day um, to be able to power uh, the planet with a population of much greater than 11 billion. The fact of the matter is, of course, that we're living on ancient sunlight. Um, but if we were able to find a way to live on real-time sunlight, that might solve our problems. And of course, trees have solved that problem in photosynthesis. So you imagine being able to actually learn from how trees uh, do photosynthesis much better and being able to not just, not just mimic that, but engineer trees, so artificial trees, to do artificial photosynthesis and one, can, one might imagine, I mean, it sounds absolutely crackers now, but one might imagine a day where there are a trillion artificial trees running a trillion living software applications powering the planet doing artificial photosynthesis. And that, you know, people are beginning to take that, uh, not, it's true, not many people, but people are beginning to take that seriously. Um, but that's fine. Um, and then finally, you know, equally, probably the biggest challenge of all 
as I said, there's going to be at least 9 billion people on the planet by 2040, and there may well be up to 11 billion people on the planet by the end of the century. And there's absolutely no known way. No government, every, every government acknowledges that there's no known solution to the, at the moment to being able to feed a population of 9 to 10 billion people. So whilst it's, all, it's very nice of us in the, in the, the West, the developed, uh, developed nations, to think that we don't need to think about engineering foods for a population of, uh, of even 6.7 billion, uh, there, you know, there are, are already 1.5 billion people who don't have enough food every day, and it's estimated that that may well be over 3 billion people by the middle of the century. So we do urgently need to think about ways in which we can engineer food for a, a burgeoning planet and programming crops uh, uh, to be able to be more resistant to a drought uh, and more an increased yield uh, in ways that are not currently possible is something that we have to consider and may well uh, prevent uh, a catastrophe by the end of the century of billions of people starving to death. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stephen. It's uh, fascinating stuff, uh, St Stephen Emot there. So, so we'll keep things moving along because uh, Stephen's very kindly made up a bit of time actually by banging through those slides really, really quickly. Um, so we'll keep the, the momentum.